I'm here to talk about Ghost King, a text adventure I developed in the spring of 2020 to be uh, a replica of 1980s hottest text adventure that never was. Now some of you know, in addition to being a classic computing nerd, I'm also a theatrical nerd, but there was not a lot of live in-person theater going on in the spring of 2020, and I knew I didn't want to do streaming productions, and I was looking for uh, some projects to work on while I was uh, trying to get some in-person theater going. Uh, not being a th filmmaker, didn't want to do streaming theater, so I did a game, and I'm not a programmer either, but I found a way to not let that stop me. Before I talk too much about Ghost King, which you can see here running uh, on a Commodore 128 emulator in the, the scot-free interpreter uh, ported by my friend Mark Seeley to the 64 and 128 earlier this year to support this project, uh, before I go into too much about Ghost King, I want to talk a little bit about uh, licensed games, specifically licensed from uh, books and plays and stories. You know, it became uh, a deserved trope in the late 80s and much of the 90s to look down on uh, licensed titles. Uh, there were a lot of uh, shovelware games that just weren't particularly good, and it, it's easy to kind of think of, of all licensed and adapted games from uh, the 8-bit era as being not very good. But really, some of my uh, favorite games and games that I uh, still enjoy and would wholeheartedly and unironically endorse to others uh, were adapted from books. Um, I, as I suspect many people did, I learned about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy from Compute's Gazette. I learned about it from the ads for the game, and then I read the book, and I really uh, wanted the game and, and enjoyed the game. Uh, it's also where I learned about uh, Nine Princes in Amber by Roger Zelazny, which is a fantasy series that I really enjoyed. Uh, adapted games were where I learned about Below the Root, which I don't consider just to be one of the best adapted games of all time, but flat out one of the best games ever. Uh, it's not a text adventure like Hitchhiker's Guide and Nine Princes is, but it's a, it's a really fantastic game. So I've always had a, a soft spot for, for adapted and licensed games, uh, a lot of interest in them. I, I really had a good time playing a lot of them. Text adventure games in the 1970s and 80s did borrow from a lot of literature. Some of it was acknowledged, like in the, the case of Hitchhiker's Guide and Nine Princes, and, and some of it wasn't. Uh, there's an entire deep vein uh, of Alice in Wonderland inspired games out there. Uh, in fact, uh, an informal uh, survey indicated that uh, Alice of Alice in Wonderland might be the first named female protagonist in a computer game. And uh, not too surprising because there are just so many Alice in Wonderland games. But a few years ago, I was looking back at uh, the, the things that hadn't had and hadn't been adapted into games, and it hit me. Where was Shakespeare in all this? Uh, he's one of the, if not the most, you know, internationally known authors of all time. All of his works are in the public domain. Uh, he wrote stories about intense and intimate personal conflicts, uh, as well as ghosts and gremlins, as well as thousands of guys running around with swords, swording each other. And it seems like all of that would have made Shakespeare a perfect vein to mine back in those days when you were looking for... Uh, you know, whether you're looking for lurid content or you're looking for things that had instant conflict, instant name recognition, because you could use Shakespeare material and his name uh, with no fear of punishment uh, because it's all public domain. But there were almost no Shakespeare games during the classic period. Uh, there were companies like Wyndham Classics and Tellarium that got started in the early mid-80s specifically to make games out of books and stories, but all of those ignored Shakespeare. Uh, there really was very little. There was a, a Shakespeare-inspired puzzle fest called Avon. There was a Macbeth game or two, and really not much else. Even the edgeware market, which I would think would have been perfect, you know, you'd sell tons and tons of copies of of Shakespeare guides to uh, you know elementary and, and high schools uh, to take people through Shakespeare plays, but there was really almost nothing. Instead, we got lots of Tolkien, lots of Lewis Carroll, lots of 19th century adventure stories in general, but no, no Danish princes, no King Henrys, nothing like that. 
And uh, this this bothered me for a long time, and I brought up the topic up uh, in a few interactive fiction text adventure discussion groups over the past year. And I, I finally saw an explanation that helped me understand, at least in part, what what happened and why. Uh, Andrew Plotkin, who's one of the, the major designers, high-profile uh, essayist and, and game designer and, and general big thinker of the post-Infocom interactive fiction era of the past 25 years, said this. This is Andrew speaking. I think it was just that genre was a more popular source than literature. I'm using genre in the condescending and negatively defined sense of not in the literature section of bookstores and definitely not taught in literature classes. So SF, fantasy, horror, mysteries. Now, Andrew's explanation doesn't address all of my questions, especially when I, but especially when I looked at the earliest commercial text adventures, his description really did make a lot of sense. In particular, it struck me that if you look at the roster of 12 games, the first 12 games that Scott Adams' company Adventure International published, and Scott Adams and Adventure International were really the, the first company that successfully and consistently brought uh, text adventures from the mainframe world to the personal computer world. Uh, when you look at that roster of games, they are practically a genre laundry list. He published a treasure cave game, and a pirate game, and a spy game, and a spooky game, and a spaceship game, and so on. Now that still didn't totally convince me that nobody could have or, or should have taken Shakespeare and run with it back then, but seeing that it never happened and not too many other people were interested in, uh, in, in making up for that, uh, that gap, it, it hit me to put that very specific scenario to the test. What if Scott Adams himself, at the height of his commercial relevance, had made a Shakespeare game? And so our adventure begins. I'd thought briefly about using one of Shakespeare's more obscure plays to make the game, but I quickly settled on Hamlet. I wanted something that I could wrap my head around quickly, that audiences could wrap their heads around quickly, and also that would lend itself to the, the kind of lurid titles that Scott Adams tended to use for his games. You know, he published games called Adventureland, and Pirate Adventure, and Secret Mission, and Savage Island, and things like that. So I wanted something that would really lend itself to, to fit in with the rest of his catalog. For a long time, this game was actually going to be called Rotten Adventure, for something rotten in the state of Denmark, uh, and I en eventually ended up settling on Ghost King, something to anchor it around, the, the ghost of Prince Hamlet who comes and, and tells him uh, basically that he's got to, uh, to avenge his murder. So I found out pretty quickly that there was a language out there called ScottKit that made it pretty easy for the likes of me, not really a programmer, to make a Scott Adams game, like using the actual database format that Scott Adams did. Because he wasn't just one of the first uh, commercially successful personal computer publishers, he was also one of the first to effectively open source his game code once his game code started to age a little bit. Uh, Scott Adams actually published one of his games in Byte Magazine, uh, just the straight up basic code for it, and that ended up becoming the template for a lot of other text adventures, both from people who were just stealing his basic code anyway, and then definitely using uh, what he had outlined in the magazine. So the Scott Adams format has been pretty well understood for a long time. It's not perfectly documented because uh, unlike uh, publishers like Infocom, which had a an interpreter and a virtual machine that were reused over and over, the Scott Adams format would vary a little bit just as, as he built out uh, what he needed to do. So there are things that are understood like uh, these flags, these you know just on-off variables that you can use to uh, to set progress, but there's no hard and fast rule about how many flags you can use. Uh, one of the, the main interpreters out there, Scott Free, just says, uh, don't use more than 32, because we've never seen more than that. So, okay, don't use more than 32. Uh, there are a bunch of counters you can use, and they're, they're counters that you can manually update, so you can use as, as timers or as quest trackers, but the Scott Kit language says, uh, yeah, we seem to have trouble switching between counters, so just use the default counter. So, all right, I, I won't do that. 
I sat down with uh, trisbort.io, which is a map making tool, and quickly created uh, just a, a very straightforward uh, uh, Castle Elsinore and Environs map, and set down to create a quest for Prince Hamlet to go on. I had a little bit of a leg up on this in that Madison Shakespeare Company, which I produce uh, for up here in Madison, Wisconsin, had just done a production of Hamlet the, that was it was stripped down. We, we shortened the script, so it was uh, less than two hours long. Uh, so I had that edit of the script, which uh, cut out a lot of the, the subplots. Uh, I had just been working on it. Uh, we did the production of it in February, so I, I was pretty familiar with it. And the uh, the director had mentioned some things about their concept that kind of stuck in my mind. And one of the concepts, because uh, it was done in modern dress, and one of the concepts was that uh, Hamlet would spend a lot of time in his pajamas, and specifically what the director called a depression robe. So then I had the idea for the first puzzle. Well, Hamlet can't leave his room until he puts on his depression robe to shield him from the rest uh, of the world. Uh, so I had the, the trope of the get out of your bedroom, uh, which is a, you know, has been used in, in commercial games like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and, and lots of games since then. I had my main character, Prince Hamlet. I had my lured title, Rotten Adventure, or later Ghost King. I had my getting out into the world puzzle, uh, getting the robe out of the wardrobe and, and putting it on, and, and only then could you open the door and go out. And then I was ready to work. Uh, the Scott Kit language, as you can see, is, is really pretty straightforward. Uh, you can create uh, rooms, you can create items, um, you can define actions. Uh, really, uh, the, the Scott Adams parser is not particularly sophisticated Aside from very basic tasks like taking items, dropping items, moving around the map, taking your inventory, taking your score, just do a very basic uh, core things, pretty much everything you do is a special case. So this action open wardrobe, when here wardrobe, like it's not that the Scott Adams parser knows what it means to open an object and then thinks really hard about whether an item is openable or not. You just say, well, in this room or when this wardrobe is here, you can open it. And if that's not true, then it just never, it never resolves correctly. The other uh, really important feature of the Scott Adams verse uh, that I learned as I was working on it is that you can only have 99 displayed messages while uh, that, that show up for the player. And there are some modern day hacks that get around that a little bit, but none of the contemporary games published by Scott Adams and by others who used his format, none of them went past that 99 limit. And so a message would be anything that has this print associated with it. So anytime we have to uh, provide a specific description for an item when we examine it, any time that we need to give feedback when we talk to a character or complete a quest, those all count towards the, the 99 limit. What doesn't count uh, towards that limit are the, uh, the room descriptions, so uh, my princely bedroom, or item names like wardrobe, closed door, open door leads out, things like that. But any time there was a print, uh, you're you're working against the 99 total. That actually uh, was a problem for me. It was one of the hardest things to debug uh, because that's not really clearly documented uh, in a lot of places, and uh, they're still working on on ways to to get around that. But it meant that I had to I had to cut short uh, any ideas I might have had of adding a whole bunch of extra content because there just wasn't room to put uh, more 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 dialogue, more more explanations in. I won't go through the, the entire source code, but I will uh, link to it uh, in the published game. Uh, you, can, you can go through it. It's about, it's about 11, 1200 uh, lines, and a lot of it is comments. So you can really see how I built out uh, the, the quests. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty faithful to the plot of the play. I did add a puzzle uh, that relates to writing a will, uh, which Hamlet doesn't actually do, but he does uh, at the end of the, the play. Uh, he does tell Horatio as he's dying uh, what he what he wants to become of the the kingdom that for all of about 45 seconds he's technically 
the ruler of. Uh, so I added, added some, some puzzle-based play, uh, puzzle-based challenges for that. I made Ophelia uh, a bit of a, a speed bump. You have to placate her a couple times to get through the game. And the other thing that I would uh, just say by way of explaining what I was doing and why was that I was working to deliberately recreate Scott Adams' style, which frankly had a lot of uh, unnecessary capitalization and questionable syntax and a lot of missing punctuation and definitely some typos uh, and mix that with uh, iambic pentameter where appropriate or with uh, just general uh, old-timey sounding language. So I'll take you through just a, a little bit of the gameplay. Uh, again, I'll include some uh, some links to the online version. It's also playable on uh, a really wide variety of, of platforms. Uh, Scott Kit itself is a Ruby application, so it's designed to work on uh, modern systems. It's a little tricky to uh, to get uh, set up. I, I found, and other people have found, and it does have one kind of annoying limitation uh, in. The way that it handles some complex uh, complex conditions and actions, there's actually a, a workaround that I document in the source code, and it's been filed to the uh, to the creator on GitHub. And fingers crossed that he he will fix it because it's kind of the one thing that keeps Scott Kit from working uh, exactly as labeled, which as labeled is a very uh, quick and easy way to put together some some really fun uh, adventure games. But I'll take you through just the, the first few moves so you get the feel. And you get the, the Scott Kit welcome message. This is both the the compiler has a built-in interpreter. The the one that you saw on the, the Vice emulator, Scott Free, uses the conventional uh, Scott Adams split screen view that was uh, most most strongly associated with the, the published games. This is more of just a, a straight uh, straight line feed uh, line printed. Uh, version. But welcome to Ghost King Salad number one, which uh, I decided to make Salad uh, Scott Adams Literary Adventure Diversions as a brand name when he re-released a number of his games uh, a few years after their first publication. Uh, they were the Scott Adams Graphic Adventures or Sagas, so I thought that Salad would be a, a nice takeoff. So I am Prince Hamlet. My father is dead, killed by my uncle father. What are we going to do about it? Well, we will open the wardrobe and in this particular uh, compilation uh, you you only need to type in the first four letters most Scott Adams games uh, only read the first three later they switched to four five is also supported by the system but we were able to get by with just four and that that helps cut down on the uh, the byte count of the game this is really only about a, a 16k database which definitely mattered back then so get the robe, get the dagger, I'll need that later. The fact that the robe has uh, stars around it means that it's a treasure, uh, because in Scott Adams style, uh, yes, you, we're Prince Hamlet and we're going through the plot of Hamlet, but it is actually a treasure hunt. There is a store, uh, a score rather, uh, you have to store treasures in the treasure room in order to earn points. That's just built in right into the game engine. Uh, so on a scale of 0 to 100, at rate 0, it's just uh, they just divide the number of, of treasures uh, available in the game by 100, and you get uh, you get points each time you drop one. The way this game is structured, the treasure room just shows up uh, at the very, very end. So you've got to bring all the treasures to the end and, and drop them, and that's how you win. So now we can open that door. It wouldn't have worked before. One of the quirks of the Scott Adams system is that although you can make a door or, or make uh, your design rooms in such a way that you can't go in a certain direction, you can't really change the room's characteristics once you're in it. So you can easily wire up a room and say that East takes you to a specific place, but you can't say East takes you to a specific place only if certain things are true. Uh, so in this case, the door is just an object, and we have to use the command to go door in order to take us through the hallway. So then if we go south, we end up back in the bedroom, but going north doesn't mean anything. We have to go door to get through. So we can explore a little bit. There's a book. We can read the book. Oh, we're too distracted now. Try later. So that just to do that is one of the 99 messages. Uh, we can reuse those messages in the code if we use the exact same string Scott Kit and the Scott Adams system are smart enough to reuse that same string so that helps cut down uh, and I do use that trick in a few places but every time I wanted a, a custom response to something 
um, I had to, to burn one of those 99 messages. So there's Horatio. We can talk to Horatio, and there's, there's some Shakespearean uh, quotes right there. I, I did a lot of, of hacking and, and slashing through the text in order to include some original authentic text. And there's, we get a, a hint. Uh, clenched fist is all in caps. We might need that later. Have you had quiet guard? That was a line as well. And there's the ghost. And here we get the plot. Again, that's uh, taken straight from the original Shakespearean text. And then the ghostly voice will cry swear as we wander around. Uh, in true Scott Adams fashion, I did include a couple of unfair deaths. Uh, most notably, if you hang around in the platform for too long, uh, you can die. There's a random check every time you're in that room, and uh, if I think it's 4% uh, in the release version. Just on every turn you're in there, uh, there's a 4% chance that you will fall to your death and break your neck, and you have to spend, I think, five turns in there total in order to complete the game. So it's unfair, but so were a lot of those early games. So... We can move through. We're in Elsinore Village, famous for its flower shops. Now, again, we only have 99 messages, so there's not a lot of room to put in, uh, you know, lots of different options for things you can do and, and examining the shops and so forth. So this game relies on you to conclude, well, what might it mean if there's a flower shop and, a, and money? Well... What if I tried to buy flowers? Oh, I get very pretty Danish flowers. And the, the D and the A are both in caps. There's a sailor over at the docks. He says Yoho, which is a Scott Adams callback. There's a cemetery. That probably will come in handy later, but right now there's nothing there. And then there's Polonius Manor with Ophelia. And this is kind of the, the first tr tricky puzzle of the game. Importune me with love, she says. I could kiss Ophelia. Well, I did love her once. I could kill Ophelia, but that's too mean. Hmm. Well, I don't know. What if I just leave? Oh, she trips, she throws herself at my feet. I trip and break my neck. The game is now over. And because of a, a quirk in the system, we still get the, uh, the room description one last time. And then we're back at the prompt. So I'm really pretty proud of the game, and uh, it was one of those creative flurries that uh, every once in a while I'm fortunate to get into. I declared my intention to create this game on May 19th, and it was published on June 12th. Uh, really, it took about a week or so to get the, the main quest lines in place and get it ready for testing. Uh, I was fortunate to have uh, a good group of beta testers who put the game through its paces, were patient with uh, some of the quirks, uh, gave me some feedback about uh, increasing the challenge level and where I could make some uh, compromises with the uh, the messages and, and so forth. Um, you know, definitely was better for having them involved. But to go from, hey, this is a thing that I wish somebody had done over the past 40 years to, okay, now it exists, uh, is something I'm really pretty proud of. Uh, I wasn't the first uh, or the only uh, person to, to think of doing something like this. Most notably, uh, there is Hamlet, the text adventure out there. Uh, it was created in 2003 by Robin Johnson. And I was, I was vaguely familiar uh, with the game before I started on this. I'd taken a look at it. His style with his Hamlet is more like a mid-80s Infocom approach, uh, kind of like 1986 uh, aesthetic. It had uh, had a lot more text, a lot, lot more uh, uh, lavish and, and well-thought-out jokes, and it's a much uh, wider-ranging uh, uh, crack at uh, Shakespeare storytelling. Uh, right here I'm just showing the TRS-80 uh, port of Scott Free, TRS-80 being you know, kind of one of the core uh, Scott Adams platforms. So again, one of the great things about making games with Scott Kit is that the database format can be played just about anywhere. Um, the website uh, ghostking.netlify.app ghostking.netlify.app uh, has the game running in DOSBox, which is uh, the DOS version of Scott Free's nice and stable and, and looks pretty good, but the, uh, the Commodore ports are also worth checking out. Uh, there are ways to uh, backport the the data file into some of the other interpreters as well, but the uh, the Scott Free approach uh, seems to be the the most reliable because that's definitely what uh, Scott Kit is expecting to output to. 
was glad to be able to share the efforts uh, with you and, and add Shakespeare to the text adventure world. I will be back. Scott Adams Literary Adventure Diversions Salad will be back with Salad number two based on the play Women Beware Women, which is not Shakespeare. It's from uh, a generation of playwright after his, uh, but it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic tale of murder and revenge and treachery, and I think it really lends itself well to the Scott Adams format. So I've got at least one Scott Adams uh, type game left in me, and we'll be happy to share that with everybody soon. So please follow uh, my work there at uh, ghostking.netlify.app, where I will definitely share information on future salad games. Enjoy the rest of your uh, virtual VCF Midwest and ECCC, and I hope to see everybody real soon.